So um, I'm Joe Doliner. I'm here from RethinkDB today. And I'm going to talk to you about the product that we're making there and we've been working on for, I guess, the last three and a half years now, which is about how long I've been there. Um, so RethinkDB, sort of the one-line slug of what it is, is it's an open source distributed data store for unstructured data. Now, that may seem to some people like sort of a jumble of buzzwords, but basically it is, is it's a database. It's distributed so you can install it on a whole cluster of machines and parallelize data access across them. You can increase the total amount of storage like that. And it's for unstructured data, meaning that unlike with SQL, you don't have to decide ahead of time how exactly you want to structure your data. You can just throw data into it. So um, sort of my goals of this, for this talk are I'm going to go over a few things. First, um, the CAP theorem, which is something that always comes up in the discussion of databases um, and sort of can't get around it because it really winds up affecting what it's like to use the database. Um, the second, which is, I think, a little bit more interesting, is a functional approach to a query language. So we have our own custom-made query language called Requel. And it's very functional in its nature. It, it draws some sort of concepts from the old, like, classic functional languages like Lisp, but it tries to be a lot more pragmatic with those concepts and get you something that has the benefits but is also very, very good for getting stuff done. Um, and lastly, what I'm hoping to show with these two things is where I think RethinkDB can sort of fit into your data science pipeline and like what sort of a tool it can be in your belt. And so to that end, rather than um, showing you a PowerPoint presentation or something just outlining how we deal with these challenges, um, I'm actually just going to do a little bit of live coding for you in RethinkDB uh, right here, and we'll just sort of do some data analysis. And I hope that that sort of serves as a platform to answer any questions you might have about the system. Uh, so first off, just getting a feel, who here programs professionally? And who here, whether or not they program professionally, has a soft spot for functional languages? <laughs> um, and lastly, and this, is, this question earns you a t-shirt, uh, who can tell me what the CAP theorem says? Or venture a guess? Yeah, red shirt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Small, medium, or large. Oh. <laughs> right. So basically, the CAP theorem, it, it's sort of like those like, pictures you see online where it's like, you know, in college, you can have like a social life, uh, something else, pick two. Um, you can't have it all. Now, one thing that I, I want to... Uh, just state is that the abbreviations for what consistency, availability, and partition tolerance are are very confusing abbreviations. And as we go into the details, we'll sort of hammer out exactly what those mean. But so with that in mind, I'm going to take you over to an actual running RethinkDB instance. Um, it's it's running right here on this MacBook, which is. Um, you know, not the fastest of things, so we can't do really heavy-duty stuff, but it's plenty fast for our purposes. And you can see right here that um, I've got this little website. And this is sort of uh, ground zero for any type of database administration work. Right? This is um, where I go in and I see what, what's going on in my cluster. How are my engineers using it? What sort of servers do I have here? And... Um, Right here in this view, you can see I have two servers, one named Jakiro and one named Wisp, um, which, are, which are being run on this machine right here. So this is one view that I'm going to be using a lot during this. And then the other one is an actual programming view. So you can see here, and I'm just going to scroll that for now. Well, you can see here, we'll, we'll see. I'm going to actually start by querying the database, and I'm going to do some simple stuff. So the way that sort of the querying the database works in RethinkDB is you use a bunch of methods which are defined on the RethinkDB module. And right now I have that imported 
as um, R. And these methods I use to construct a query, which is then just a native Python object, and I run it. So I'm going to use a method called expr to construct the standard introductory um, assignment in any programming course, which is hello world. The, that's better? Okay. So I call expert on hello world. And what expert does is it just takes a native Python object and converts it into something that the database understands. So if I evaluate this, you can see I get a requal query instance of the string hello world. And then when I have a query that I like, I can send it over to the server and see what it thinks of it. So I'm going to take this hello world query and I'm going to call run on it. And so what's happening here is it gives me back the string hello world. Um, and what actually happened there is hello world got compiled down into a protocol buffer. That gets sent over to the server, which then does some processing on it. In the case of just a simple constant evaluation, it doesn't have to do anything. And it sends it back to me. Now, what's really cool about this and sort of the whole reason that you can see um, sort of the whole reason that this becomes very usable is that queries compose using Python's built-in structures. So I'm going to define another query, and this one I'm going to bind to a variable. And this is the query which evaluates just to one. So now, the cool thing about this is, suppose I want to do some basic math. I want to do addition. I can take this query object, and I can add it to itself. And I get back another query, which presents the addition. And then when I take this query and run it, again, it gets packaged up into protocol buffers and sent over to the server where it evaluates the addition. And it sends me back the answer, which, of course, too, there should be no surprise it's there. Um, but the point and why, why this becomes powerful is that queries are, in essence, these abstract syntax trees. And native programming languages become the perfect tools for evaluating these syntax, for creating these syntax trees and sending them over to the server. And so right now, I'm doing it in Python. We have um, very equivalent drivers in Ruby and JavaScript. And um, there's also 12 other third-party languages that are supported. So any questions with that, that concept of how queries are made first? No? Everyone's good? All right. So we can make queries. That's great. But of course, the whole point of a database isn't to be some like programming language that I evaluate over the, the wire. It's um, supposed to be for storage. And so the standard abstraction we use for storage is tables, which um, if you've done any sort of data science, I suspect tables are, are nothing new to anyone. Some, some people call them collections or buckets. but they're all basically just this container for your data. So in RethinkDB, um, I can create a table call using the table create method. So doing this, I'm making a table called foo. And when I evaluate it, it's going to send me back this little summary object saying, I created a table for you. Um, and then if I want to insert data into it, all that I need to do is call an insert method. Do that, it sends me back another summary object. And you can see it has a bunch of things that it didn't do, like deleting documents. But it did insert one document. And then it also has this weird field here called the generated keys. So, and this will be another t-shirt question. Who can tell me what a primary key is in a table? Exactly. Small, medium, or large. Yeah. Um, so what he said is that the primary key is the one that uniquely identifies something in the table. Um, and so basically, you just inserted this data into the table, but every, we make every piece of data have a unique identifier in it. Now, the thing is that it needs to have a unique identifier, but it would be really annoying if you had to come up with a unique identifier every single time. 
So instead, if you just insert something without a unique identifier, we just create one for you. That's just a UUID there that we created. Um, and so now I've inserted this data, and to get it back is quite pleasant in Python. I can just use the bracket operator because it's overloaded. So when I do that, I get back my one piece of data. Now, there are a couple of things that I'd sort of like to point out here. One is that I just inserted a plain Python dict. I didn't, I didn't have to do anything special to do it. It's just a dict. And that's really, really convenient if I'm a Python programmer because chances are any data source I can think of, I know how to get it as Python dicts. Like, I know how to leverage some API that I find, parse the JSON, and get the dicts out. And once I know how to do that, then I just need to call insert, and now I've got it in a distributed database where I'm ready to do some data processing on it. Um, now, the other thing I'm going to show you, and I'm going to take you back to the web UI here, where I can see what sort of management I can do on this table. So we were just in the servers tab. We have another one here for tables. And here's the table I just created, foo. Now, I just get some sort of basic information about the table, what's, what's going on with it right now. Zin writes, there's sharding and replication, which is stuff that we'll get to in a little bit. And then down here, I can see that exactly which server in the cluster is being used for this table. And so what happened when I did the table creation <laughs> is that it figured out, based on what others were doing, which server would be a good one for hosting this data based on how many other commitments it already had. And it selected WISP to be the primary. And if I want to, if I uh, you know, want to have an extra copy of this data around, all I need to do is have two replicas instead of one, which is just a quick away here in my little read graph that I do, quick little read. And now I have two copies of the data, one on WISP and one on Jakiro. And so RethinkDB uses a primary secondary architecture. Um, it's also sometimes called a master-slave architecture. So question is, why use a primary secondary architecture? What does having a primary give you from a CAP perspective? Uh, yes, founder of RethinkDB. <laughs> Exactly. And I guess you, you probably want a medium. <laughs> um, so right, so it gives you consistency. Having, having a, uh, a single node that all of the data goes through guarantees that no two nodes are ever going to disagree about the value of the data because the secondaries just learn from the primary that's going on. Um, so it depends on exactly how you configure it. The propagation is not synchronous, um, and actually this is, fits very nicely with the view that I have. The propagation is not synchronous if um, you don't want it to be. So right now you see how I have this right here, where I'm highlighting one right axe. So that's how many replicas need to acknowledge the right before the, um, the right that I did in Python gets acknowledged to me. So right now it's just one, which means that um, just the primary is going to acknowledge. So it could be non-consistent, yes? The reason that um, it can't be is that if you really want to do a consistent read, you also route that through the master. Um, you can if you don't want to, because that's, that's an extra hop. You can read in an out-of-date fashion. That's not guaranteed to be consistent, but it's faster. Exactly. Uh, any other questions on this? This is, this is where it gets sort of, um, you're making those cap trade-offs. This is, this is why I've, I've, I've said this a couple of times that the cap theorem is useful, but if all you know about a database is, is which two letters it picked, you probably don't know the full story. Because all of the requirements within the cap theorem are really, really lofty requirements um, that you can sort of meet halfway a lot of the time and have it be be useful. Um, okay, so I've created this table. I've this, and like I said, the real reason that I think that this is useful and that I like using this API is I get to use native Python objects, and I know how to get those for anything that I want. 
And so that's actually exactly what I did, which, um, and the API I used was Wikipedia's API. So I assume if you guys are, are quick, you probably saw when I came in here to the table foo that I've also got this other table wiki. And this is loaded with um, about a quarter million articles from Wikipedia. And um, I, I just loaded these in using, using their API. I parsed some JSON. It was probably a 50-line script to scrape it all. It's quite easy. And I'm going to take you back to, well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into actually the Data Explorer here, which is a third tab in our administration. And this lets me actually, sorry, question in the back. How many megabytes is that? Um, database, uh, that's probably in like hundreds of megabytes. I can tell you for sure in a, in a second. Out. Um, but yeah, so we're just doing this on a MacBook. I actually had a demonstration set up with like all of these clustered EC2 nodes, but it sort of EC2'd itself to death, and I didn't want to risk having that happen in the middle of the talk. So we're just doing it locally on the MacBook. And so I'm just going to give you guys a look at what one of these documents is. And here, again, I'm going to access the table, except this time it's wiki. And I'm going to do a get. Now, this just uses the primary key that we were talking about to ret retrieve a document. And I'm just going to type in this magic number here, which um, I have written down ahead of time, because I happen to know that this isn't a gigantic document that's going to fill my screen and everything down. So, as you can see in this Wikipedia, or in this document, I've got the content of the article. And I've got it in this kind of strange form, which is that I've taken, rather than having one big string to represent the content, I've tokenized it into an array. And you'll see why I did that in a second when I do the data analysis. That would be a pretty easy thing to do live during the data analysis, except that the query would take a little bit of time, and I didn't want to make everyone wait for that. So I've pre-processed it a bit to get that working. Then I've also got the links. Um, from this, this article to other articles out of it. And if you see, a link is represented as this object that's an NS, which is, stands for namespace, which I believe is just the language. So zero just means English Wikipedia. And then finally, I've got um, some page properties, the page ID, which is um, the primary key, and the title of the document, which is the 1985 Helsinki Protocol on the reduction of sulfur emissions. So I've got these documents in here, and I want to find something out about them. So I'm going to step out of this into my programming environment because I'm going to do something a little bit heavy, more heavy duty. So the first thing that I think might be an interesting question to ask and why um, I chose to tokenize the content is I'm going to try to count word frequencies within these documents. So I'm going to take my document that I already had, and the first thing I'm actually going to do is save myself some typing by putting that in a variable. So now I can just type wiki.get. And I'm going to get out my variable here. I'm going to, I'm going to get out my document here, uh, the one on the sulfur emissions. And I'm going to try to figure out, all right, so how many times is sulfur mentioned in this document? This will be just a good test because sulfur should be mentioned at least once. So I select the content field from it. And notice I get, I get to just use my standard Python operators here. And then I call the count method, which is a rethink DB thing, but I think there's an equivalent thing in Python that just lets me count sulfur. And run that, you see what that query looks like, presentation of it, oh god. And when I run it, I get back that there's four instances of the word sulfur in there. Nothing we wouldn't expect. Um, now what's kind of cool is that I'm going to want to apply this function to a lot of documents. And so, just like when I'm programming in Python, I can very easily abstract out this little one-line query into a function. And so I'm going to define one right now, which is just a general one, called word count. And word count is going to take two arguments. It takes a word and a document. And it just returns that value. It returns the document, select out the contents. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. So like I said that, and so now I've got this function here, and I just felt like I wrote a Python function, but I can just as easily use this as a RethinkDB function. And it works. And so what's actually happening here is because of how sort of we know how to compile these functions. We're not actually hacking Python code here. I can go to detail, but it knows how to take this function, call it on these objects to accumulate the abstract syntax tree. And I get to feel like I'm basically writing um, Python code when I actually get to send this to the database and have it be all distributed for me. So let's actually, please. Yes. Exactly. So, right. So, yeah. So the, que the question is, we're actually running this code. And um, this is sort of like, this is the real crux of, of what we we're doing and what makes this query language tick, is that we take these functions, and the way it actually works is we pass in these little representation objects that are variable. And then, you know, it does something like a call count method. And we run now you've got a variable that has you go through, you accumulate this abstract syntax tree, and then you sort of see what comes out the other side. And what comes out the other side is actually your query. You just put it in there, and eventually you get the whole query, and you just package it up and send it over. And all of these functions get represented as something the server understands. And to us, we sort of saw this as powerful because we knew, okay, now we can actually make a pleasant way to represent a, serve, a function on the server. And we know that basically once you've got functions, you can do almost everything. You know, functions are just such a powerful thing, um, particularly for everyone who said they have a soft spot for functional languages. You know this like twice as much. Um, you, you can really get so much just out of having these functions. That's what we do. So um, let's do something more interesting with this function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map this function over the table. And so, you know, I'm sure most people are familiar with map, either from MapReduce or just from your favorite p functional language. But for those who aren't, what map does is easily it takes a stream of objects. Um, in this case, they're the objects in a table. And it applies the function I give it to every single element of the stream and gives me back a stream of objects that are the applications of that function. So in this case, my, stream of, my objects in the stream to begin with are Wikipedia articles, and the object they gave me back is how many times they see a word. And the word that I'm going to look for is love, because I figured that would be a little bit more evocative than sulfur. And so, now this will give me a quarter million numbers, which, um, well, it, it'll package it up into a sort of lazily evaluated cursor object. But if I wanted to actually show you the result of this query, um, well, I'd need to just scroll a bunch of output. So rather than do that, I'm going to bring in the counterpart to map, which is reduce. And what reduce does is it takes a stream of objects and a function to combine them. And it gives me a way to compact them all up into a single value. So reduce. And my reduce function is just going to be addition. So this query right here will iterate just through all of the Wikipedia articles that I have and tell me how many times it sees the word love. And I'm actually not going to run this as is because it would take a little bit longer than I want it to on this Mac. Unfortunately, um, our performance on Macs isn't great right now. We only have uh, a 32-bit binary for them. So. So we'll run this, ah, and what we found is that 2,000 is not enough. So actually, because, one second, that will be 2,000 documents. So that's going to run for a second. And there's some interesting things about this query that I want to point out. 
So the nice thing, and oh, it's already done, and it found 11 copies of the word love. And we can that on a few more and more copies. But what's really interesting about this query and why um, I find this very, very useful is that because we have these functions that we can compile up, we know with the constructions of map and reduce how to distribute them. And that's exactly what we do. So this, this query, which was pretty simple, you know, Pythonic style code to write, is actually a massively distributed query if I put it on a big cluster. If I have 16 machines, it can use all of them right out of the box. And I don't need to do anything special to make it do that. Um, and this is really the whole reason that, you know, Hadoop has enjoyed such popularity and why Google uses MapReduce so much is that once you can express stuff in terms of MapReduce, you already know how to scale it. Um, and this is, this is no exception. This is exactly what we get out of MapReduce as well. Um, so any, any questions on how this gets run? Yeah, yeah, sorry. So the question is if it's, if it's possible that we could be doing a distributed reduce at a time when it's actually uh, more beneficial to not do a distributed reduce. So for that to be the case, you would somehow have to have a reduce function which made your data bigger than the entire than the data set was to begin with, um, because the only way, basically, we we distribute the reduce as much as the data is distributed, um, and the main goal of that is to not have to copy all of the data over the network. It is generally not possible to detect if a function is going to produce. Um, a data, data that's bigger than the, the data going into it. The feeling that that case is quite rare. Um, you know, I mean, the main, the main justification for doing the distributed reduce is avoiding that data copy. But no, if there was such a case, then we would be doing it in a suboptimal way, yes. Yes. So it is, it is possible that, uh, sorry, the question again, yeah. It's possible that you could receive an inconsistent result um, if you have multiple replicas. And the answer is that um, you can get inconsistent result b across documents. So if somebody inserts two documents at a time, it's possible, or rather if they insert document A and then they insert document B, it's possible that depending on which tables they were inserted to or which shards they got routed to, you could see document B without seeing document A. Um, this is kind of a price you pay in a distributed system because if you don't want to do that, if you want to have a fully acid system, uh, you have to pay some pretty significant performance costs. And yeah, the real um, particular use case where we've gotten a lot of people who are actually using this is in real-time analytics because they're you don't really care if like one user clicked on something and then another one clicked on it and you see user B's click but not user A's click. Um, if you really, really need that, that atomicity and consistency, RethinkDB is probably not a good choice because we sacrifice that to get to make stuff really useful for real-time stuff. Sorry, what kind of what? Oh, what kind of lag between the replication? Um, well, so that we actually, um, you mean in terms of how long to get to the secondary and be usable there? I mean, so in terms of that, that's heavily, going to be heavily influenced on what your network latency is. Um, yeah, I unfortunately, I mean, we are planning to publish full performance numbers, but I don't, really have anything I'd feel comfortable saying is like a scientifically measured thing right now on that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ah, 
So there's, there's two, th sorry. The question is, suppose, suppose we inserted uh, a piece of data. It goes, it goes to the master. It, it goes to one node. It goes to a second node. But a third node has some sort of a transient failure. Um, now, of course, in these cases, we don't know what the transient failure is. We just know that he didn't get back to us. Right? And so in that case, it depends on how you've configured your table. If you've configured your table such that, look, I don't want to get an acknowledgment for this until every single node It's too long to respond, then we say, this, this guy's unavailable. This the other part of this question is, well, now, what happens when this node does come back online? Um, and the answer is that when a node comes back online and it is missing a chunk of the data, it will try to get back in contact with the other people who have that data and bring itself up to date. Uh, the question is, what happens if it's missing the last 10 minutes of writes? And if it is, then it takes, it basically sends, okay, here's the last write I saw by, um, we keep just an, a counter on the master. And it radios them and says, okay, this is the last write I saw. Start giving me writes since then. And it just gets in a stream of the writes. It's, we call this a backfill, but it basically just fills it in on everything that it missed. Um, okay, so. Where we were in the talk, we've compiled this data, we've, um, or we've compiled these functions, we've sent them over, and I've counted the number of occurrences of a word. So that's fine, but to do data analysis, I want to do something a little bit more interesting, which is that um, rather I want to look at the percentage of the words in an article which are a certain word. And that's going to be a little bit closer to telling me what the article might actually be about. So I'm going to define a slightly more complicated function than my previous one called word percent. And like word count, that just takes a word in a document and, well, we all know how to compute a percent. The first thing I do is compute the numerator. And now what's kind of nice about this is since these are Python functions, there's absolutely nothing to say that I can't just call my old function from the new one. Over then, I also need to grab the total count of things in the document. And lastly, I'll just return their quotient. And so again, you know, looks to God like I'm writing a Python function define that and if I didn't make any mistakes now I'm going to apply this to my old friend and I'm going to see that this post is 1.4 percent sulfur um, which is to say that 1.4% of the words that occur in it are sulfur. And so I remember that was four, so this is like a, what, who's good at math? It's not a big article, I cho of course, because that's why I chose this article. But i um, got this function, and I'll just sh show you because um, it's kind of nice to see what this query actually looks like. And you can see my queries are starting to get long. These are starting to be actual decent size abstract syntax trees. Um, so the last thing I want to do is I want to actually use this to, as a way to navigate through my documents and find documents that might be related to a certain topic based on the fact that a high percentage of the words in the document are that word. So the thing is, I could write a query like this. And order by is just a way to order by some sort of a function, get everything in orders that it turns. And I could do percent. Now, 
this query would return everything in the order of the percentage of the words in these documents that are love, if it ran. But it won't run because the data won't fit in memory, and to sort things, they will. Actually, it kind of might on this, but in most real cases, your data isn't going to fit in memory, so you can't do it like this. So um, we, didn't, we didn't want to implement ordering of things that don't fit in memory because that's an easy way to shoot yourself in the foot and get stuff to be real slow. And when you're really targeting real-time systems, that's um, sort of more rope than people necessarily should be given. Um, but so when you're using a database and you can't sort stuff in memory, what can you do? What's, what's the standard way that you combat this problem? File sort? Basic idea. Sorry, what was the answer down there? Oh, no, that's someone on the phone. Um, <laughs> the, the, the answer I'm looking for here is an index, which is sort of what file sorting is, so I'll give you a t-shirt. Ah, uh, small, medium, large. Well, I'll get it to you after the talk. Um, so, that's right, we create an index. And RethinkDB supports secondary indexes out of the box. And they're about as pleasant to create as everything else. Um, I can create one using the index create command. And so I'm going to call this index love percent. And I pass it a function. And this function is just something that it applies to every single document. And the value it gets back, that's what it inserts it into the index as. Now, when I run this function, it's going to fail. And you can see in this error message that it says that the index percent already exists. And the simple reason for this is just that I already ran this query ahead of time so that we don't have to wait for it to complete while we're here. But the way I ran it is exactly the same as the thing I just typed in. Promise. So now I can use this. And now I have a way to see what are the articles on Wikipedia that contain the word love the most. And the way that I do this is I call order by. And now rather than passing in function, I can pass in the name of an index. And if I were to run this query, it would give me a bunch of things that have nothing to do with love because it's sorting us in ascending order. So we have this kind of funky syntax to turn things around and sort in descending order. So I'm going to run this, and it's going to crunch for a second. And um, well, while this while this goes, any questions? Yes. Ah, so what kind of limitations do we have? So there are the limitations that exist basically because we haven't sort of implemented the supporting functions for them. So like off of the top of my head, there, there are sort of a lot of library functions that I've come to expect like Python to have that it just doesn't, that our requal query language doesn't have. Um, but, oh, actually, sorry, one sec, let me. get this to a form that we can actually see. Um, there, there is, but I'm not quite sure if it's, it's like underscore something. But I don't, it, it <laughs> there's definitely a way to do it. Um, uh, yeah, so, so you definitely can. I just don't know the what it's called in this REPL. Um, so this is going to be something. And actually, I'm going to put a limit on this query so that we only get 10 results. Sorry. So we're saying the limitations of what you can set over it. Really, um, it's a pretty expressive query language. Um, things get 
there are a few things that Python doesn't really give you access to. So like plus you saw was very, very intuitive because it's overloaded. Python doesn't let you overload like unary negation. It doesn't let you overload uh, Boolean inversion. So some of those things you have to stray a bit off the beaten path. But you can really have quite complex functions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you can call you can call map reduces from within uh, functions. The only thing that you can't do within a secondary index is you can't pass it a non-deterministic function. So, um, and this is for good reason because the function isn't evaluated um, in a central place like on the master. It's evaluated uh, on each individual replica. And if you had a non-deterministic um, function, then different replicas could ha wind up with different impressions of what this secondary index looked like. And then, then you get a very strangely behaving database. Um, but any language functions can be called within there as long as they're not like random number generation and stuff like that. Uh, those, those we consider non-deterministic too. Sorry, yes. What about uh, network calls and RPCs? You can generally um, do, so right now I don't think that we have a good way for you to actually like call out into sort of the outside world from within the database. Um, we have had proposals to add that and may well. However, you can't do those inside of a secondary index, again, because, yeah, if two people call out into the outside world, we don't know they're going to get the same thing, and if things are different, then uh, everything gets wacky. Any other questions? Yes. Completely globally aware, stored per machine, but from a query language perspective, they have to think about is in this. You have to think about oh, this t this table is stored sharded across these two machines. It thinks about that in terms of how it manages the data, but um, I just think there's an index on this table. I can access the index using get methods and stuff. And then um, because I figured this would, would come up, I also created sort of the opposite index, which is the hate percentage, um, which was actually unfortunately what I had open when you guys, when I opened up this view. Um, and so this is going to give me some uh, less savory articles off of Wikipedia. And then the results are in. You can see they're as, as unsavory as one might have imagined. Um, the <laughs> so the, yeah, yeah, actually a lot of Texas. <laughs> a surprising amount of Texas, in fact. <laughs> um, yeah, so the data we store in a B tree, and um, sure tons of people are familiar with B trees, but basically the well, idea is they're like a binary search tree or any other sort of tree for storing data, except that um, they store things in blocks so that they're very, very efficient at using various buffer sizes. The whole idea of that is that a lot of times with a disk, it's just as efficient to read four kilobytes off of disk as it is to read one kilobyte off of disk. So you might as well get your money's worth out of that full four kilobytes. Um, but the main things that they give you from an API perspective is that they give you the ability to select things based on the primary key, but they also give you the ability to get ranges of keys. Um, and that's, that's how we do all of these range operations. If you want. So, so you mean if you want to sort of get something that has a particular value for something that's not the primary key? So if you want to do that, that's going to be a linear scan, unless you create an index. Now basically what the index is, it's really exactly the same structure. It's a B tree and it actually uses exactly the same code paths in the entirety of our product. Um, it's just that at the very end, it's indexing by these different values. 
very end, rather than store the actual value, it stores a pointer over to the primary B tree. So we only store one copy of the data, and really we've got just all of these B trees hanging above it, pointing down into this data so that you can access it in these interesting ways. And that's how. Getting back to uh, chainability. So I sort of passed over it without thinking about it, but in, in Requel, as a language, we have a fairly sophisticated type system that lets you do various things. So as an example, when I take this object, um, it's a table. And I can see this because I can actually call a type of method on it. That's a table. And um, when I chain an operation, so when I say this dot map, we're actually object that I can map over. Um, we basically are implementing, um, you're familiar with virtual functions in abstract classes, something, this is like a virtual method on, that some types have that they can be mapped over. So another example of a type that I can map over is just an array, and I can create a Python array using expr, and I'll just do one, two, three, four, like this. And so I run that, I get back one, two, three, four, and then I want to, I can chain map off, off of that, and um, let's just add one to it. And I get two, three, four, five back. Um, is that you want to know about chain? Ah, uh, I see. So this, this guy knows the answers to the questions, of course. Um, <laughs> but, right. To these. It's an array. And then when I apply to it, still get back an array. And that means, of course, if I want to buy another one, maybe this time I'll multiply by two. And it just is going. And these, these pipelines, these become um, very, very intuitive once you work with it for a while. The idea of like, okay, I'm, I get this data out of the table and then I pass it through this transformation and this transformation and then I bring in this other table and stuff. Um, it actually becomes a pretty good way to visualize how the data is actually flowing around. So the, the dot is, the question is, do we make one trip to the server with the dot? When you chain things, that's just adding stuff onto the abstract syntax tree. And in fact, I should have showed this before, but what does the abstract syntax tree look like? Well, I've got my array, and then I've got a map, and then I've got a map, and just keep going. It's all, it's all just one round trip. Again, sorry. The question is, at what point should you run the code in? Um, the answer is, when you're worried about that, that. So I don't know, there's sort of a database phrase which is oft spoken about bringing the query to the. The reason that you do this is these abstract syntax trees are just you know, a few bytes, really. Um, it's like nothing to transport over the network, whereas your data can be terabytes. And so if your data is small, then you might as well just load it into Python and use your environment there because, you know, this might be like writing Python code, but it's not, it doesn't have everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, so people who are using and who just know MySQL really well. Um, I'll give you my a, a kind of really the best the best argument is 
the ability to write these native functions. You know, like I've used SQL and I learned the syntax there, but it just doesn't feel as expressive to me as writing these functions that I already know, sort of serializing them. Um, that being said, actually, I'm going to ask Slime because he does a lot more marketing and probably has a, a better answer. So, yeah, I think the field is going to evolve up a bit, and and people will spend more time adding features to all of these products to make them more viable for analysts. Um, that just hasn't happened yet because the field overall is young. And I think what happens um, is whenever you have a use case that's really, really good for NoSQL, it's like developers pick the product, and then operations people scale it out, and analysts are sort of left out for now. Right? So there are data scientists that write some queries for this that work, but like analysts, um, are, it's not quite the right products for them yet. Um, but I think they will change in the next couple of years. Unfortunately, that's the best answer uh, we can give you. And I bet every other NoSQL vendor would probably say the same thing. Uh, yes, so the question is, do replicas participate in the computations? And the answer is absolutely. Um, in fact, sort of a, a little lie here, easier to tell, is we refer to a primary and a replica. And in terms of the way that that's implemented, we have the notion of a primary, which is just something that queries go through to get in a canonical order. And then they're sent out to the replicas. And there's absolutely no reason in our code that you even have to have a replica, meaning a copy of the data, on the same machine as the primary. We just always do, because that's a lot more intuitive to think about. But yeah, there's no such thing as a special replica, really. Um, except for the fact that replicas could be out of date, and then they don't participate in the query. Yeah, so, so certain types of queries, you know, um, yeah, I mean, basically anything, if you, if you want to be able to run twice as many queries, then a lot of times you can just add a replica and you'll be fine. Please. Um, so, I know of a few. First off, the question, the question is who in the community is using RethinkDB? Um, I believe that there are at least a few companies here who are actually using RethinkDB in production. So if any of them, um, well, if that's true and anyone wants to speak up, we would love to hear from you. Um, and other than that, actually, I don't know who has said they're OK with us saying they're using RethinkDB. There are hundreds of production deployments right now. And usually what happens is people don't necessarily pick it for their core data set because they're careful um, you know, about database usage. But they pick it for sort of an auxiliary data set. So one example of this is analyzing logs. Like if you don't want to buy Splunk um, and you have logs coming in from different systems, you pick RethinkDB. And people very often just write these queries ad hoc. Um, to discover things. So sort of like rewriting, you know, if you don't want to get Splunk or Mixpanel or something like that, people use RethinkDB for that a lot. Um, and usually it starts out with a use case like this, something auxiliary, and then it starts growing out um, where people get comfortable with the language, they get comfortable with the system. And at this point, there are quite a few production deployments of um, relatively like medium-sized clusters for a real-time system, about six to eight machines uh, with um, real-time stuff. So it's really everything from you know, building web applications or mobile applications or doing simple analytics, it's not quite as good as like Hadoop or Vertica for that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're doing simple analytics, we think is great, um, real time, but normally people would call all up. So really it's, I mean, it's a database, right? So it's pretty horizontal and the use cases are all over the place. Um, it's usually more for real time things, not analytics type things. Um, and that's just sort of been the case so far and we're really optimizing for it. So I think it's gonna stay Stay that way for a while. I actually don't know who the who asked the question, so I was just speaking. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. 